didn't think uh, yeah, we are recording. No problem. Uh, yep. Yes, yes, we can see. Okay, excellent. So what I thought I'd do is, is just give you some, a little bit of background as to who I actually work for. So I work uh -huh. for an organization called CSIRO, which is the Australian Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization. So we basically the national research organization for Australia. Uh, partly funded by government, but a lot of collaborative funding, working with universities uh, and other research organizations, not just in Australia, but around the world. A uh, fairly large organization. We've got about five and a half thousand people uh, working for CSIRO. Not all researchers. Obviously, we've got all the support staff, human resources, legal, all that kind of thing as well. Uh, a fairly substantial contribution to the economy, as you can see from that slide. Around four and a half billion a year. Obviously, that's <laughs> been impacted like everyone else by coronavirus. Uh, and we're not quite sure what bottom line will be uh, once we get out of this situation that we're in with the coronavirus. So currently we've got 57 sites uh, around the country uh, and I am here in Adelaide. So this is a map of Australia, Sydney, Melbourne. Those are the two big cities, if you like. And then we've got Brisbane up here. Adelaide is a, a relatively small each state and territory as a capital city so our capital city for south australia where i am is in adelaide which is which is here number three so we've actually got three sites in adelaide uh, and each site has a particular research speciality so in adelaide we have land and water health and biosecurity and food and nutrition so what i thought i would do is rather than me going about csr i'll just show you a really short video clip that CSIRO did a few years ago now, but it sort of gives a flavor of what CSIRO is and what CSIRO do. I can't hear. Hello, I can't hear. Wonderful. So I just thought that little video sort of gives you a really nice snapshot of what CSIRO do. But here's a slide that gives you a little bit more detail. So these are the areas. There aren't many areas of research that CSIRO aren't involved in in one form or another. And of course, with the space agency, astronomy and space science has become uh, supposed to the forefront, a lot of what we're doing right now. So again, that, it's just a snapshot, really. I mean, <sighs> lost count of how many patents and collaborations and partnerships there are. We're just a, 
a huge organization and a great organization to work for. So education, so CSIRO has been around for just over 80 years and education has been with CSIRO, our business group, for about 40 years now. Uh, and it's been through a, very, a, a number of different changes and evolutions. Uh, and probably where we are now was, is, is our strongest, I suppose, position within CSIRO. So if you go to the CSIRO website, there's lots of information on there. And we've actually got a link to a dedicated education website for CSIRO. And this is what you'd find if you go on there. So I suppose a fairly standard web page with lots and lots of links on to some of the programs that we do. So we've got probably around 15 education programs right now, which have a mixture of student focused and teacher focused. So teacher professional learning. We have some great opportunities for teachers. CSIRO manage the research vessel, the investigator, uh, and we try to put two or three teachers on that two or three times a year, working with researchers. They could be or in the Pacific, they could be in the Southern Ocean, they could be anywhere. It's a fantastic opportunity. But as you can see, we've got Globe down there. So we've got a link to Globe on that uh, homepage for the education. And if you actually follow that link, you get to a dedicated Globe program page. So this is what I've sort of developed in uh, partnership with our IMT people. And what I do is I update this. So you can see currently we've got the trees around the globe campaign up there advertised. And this is a link to the globe uh, page for that particular campaign. Uh, we are in a partnership with the space agency. You can probably spot the space agency logo down here. And I'll explain that a little bit more later on. Uh, and again, this takes you to the actual globe uh, page where you can register to the globe program. Uh, so uh, I suppose fairly high profile out there. So how do we actually communicate what we're doing? So we have a term newsletter that we send out to school teachers uh, one a term, so four times a year. And that term letter we put on any events or activities or new programs or developments uh, that are happening. So this was a webinar that I organized earlier this month and that went advertised in the term newsletter and then got advertised on the website as well. Uh, we had about 50 registrants for that and about half of them actually turn up. Uh, this is a, again, a, a mail out. This is a, we've also got a program called Cyber Taipan, which you might be familiar with, which is run by our digital careers people. Uh, and because of this, the data and, da and the potential for analytics with the GLOBE program, they were more than happy to actually advertise the GLOBE program with their uh, fortnight, uh, monthly, I think they mail out, email out, and they've got something like 4,000 uh, registrants to their e mailing list. This is a, I suppose, an initiative that I'm running on the 7th of September or promoting. Uh, and it's the United Nations International Day of Clean Air for Blue Skies. So what we do is we have a e-newsletter, which is a part of a magazine that we used to produce hard copies. Well, we still do, but we do produce an e-copy as well for school-age students called Double Helix. Uh, and because the 7th of September is the International Day of Clean Air for Blue Skies, we're running a little, uh, ad, ad, I suppose, a promotion to encourage people to get out there and use the globe and use the Observer app. So as I say, I've delivered three, I think now, teacher PD sessions. These are online because of course we can't do anything face to face right now. Uh, and this is how I've sort of started, if you like, the program. Obviously, you know, there's an introduction to globe, what globe is. And then I talked to them about the three main options. So the actual, I call option A, the full globe program, if you like, where you register on an account and your students can upload data. Uh, yeah, the whole program. And then option B, where uh, citizen scientists and teachers and students and, and, uh, and the general public, of course, can use the Globe Observer app. And then I talk about option C. Obviously, I want them to, to adopt option A because that means that they've got a school account and there's more of a tendency for them to collect data and upload data using the protocols 
and go through the protocol training. Uh, but often I'll say to them, you know, have a look, option C, you still get access to all the materials, you can't upload the data, but you can still use the Globe Visualize system. Uh, and it'll get you some idea of the potential of using the program in your, in your classroom with your students. So that's how I sort of start. And then as an ex-classroom teacher myself, I sort of adopted the idea that it would be good to show them some of the things that they might do using the GLOBE program. So I started with some fairly simple ones uh, where we talked about observing clouds. Uh, and you can see, you know, I, I showed the sort of 12-month period of data, cloud data collection uh, globally using the, the program. And then, what, you know, talk to them, and this is obviously an open discussion I have with the teachers, just talk to them about why you would use clouds. Why would you take your students out there and use clouds? Uh, and some of them are really good, and they're more than happy to, like most teachers, are, are happy to participate. And we talk about things like, you know, globs are an intrinsic part of the water cycle. Uh, you know, the clouds affect the amount of sunlight that gets to Earth, so they obviously have a, a, you know, a significant impact on climate. Uh, you know, climatology, climatologists look at cloud movement around the globe, all that kind of thing. So, you know, giving them some, some I suppose, some justifications to why they might use it in the classroom. And, and, you know, starting with a relatively simple option with the clouds observation. And then we talked about uh, recording temperature, so daily temperature. And, you know, if you've got primary school students, then it might not necessarily be okay with a lot of the technology. So I just tell them, you know, you can get out there with a alcohol thermometer and record temperature, get them out there doing some data collection. Or you can go the whole log, get yourself a instrument shelter and start recording maximum and minimum temperatures and uploading them to the, uh, to the database, of course. So that's a, an introduction. And then I, really going to the sort of the visualize and what you can do with the data even if you're not collecting the data which obviously i encourage them to do you can still use the program you still have access and there's still some great resources on there so i actually chose what i do is tell them you know once you start collecting data look at another site that have been collecting temperature data that's on a similar line of latitude to yours and then you can look at the effect that you know, different hemispheres might have, or elevation, for example. So I just happened to come across these two. These two schools are in Saudi Arabia, and use this as an example. Because uh, what I want to do is, I'm trying to appeal to maths teachers and science teachers and geography teachers. So it's very cross-curricular, is the approach that I've had with this. So I looked at these two schools and told them these two schools are literally 30 k's apart, 30 kilometers but there's a difference of uh, 800 meters in elevation. So, you know, what impact might that have on the temperature difference between the two schools? And what can you do with it, you know, once you've identified that, that you know, there's, there's a potential to do some kind of activity with the students from this. And this is the bit that teachers like, because there's a real sort of hands-on practical application with this. So all I did again, and I'm sure I'm preaching you anything that you don't already know is took the two schools took the temperature data and looked at the patterns so there's a lot of activity that you can actually build around that you know the patterns are, are virtually mirror of each other but there's a significant difference in ta in temperature affected by elevation so then we talked about lapse rate you know you, you get your kids to do a, an elevation temperature contour so there's, a, as I say, a significant number. And if you've been doing this a long time, forgive me if I'm telling you something you already know. The biggest challenge that I've found with GLOBE is that because it's very America-focused, it's finding things that transfer readily to the Australian curriculum and Australian classrooms. And this is a typical example. So I like the idea of green up, green down, because what that means is that teachers are not committed to being out there every day doing something. You're only going to be out there, you know, once a day, probably for three or four weeks in springtime or, you know, late, mid-autumn for green up, green down. So there's not a, a big commitment that some teachers, you know, they want just a few weeks worth and this fits it fits the bill perfectly. The problem is that most of the things that were suggested on the GLOBE website of are plants that don't necessarily grow in Australia. Most of our plants are perennial. So it's difficult to look at that, 
early bud growth in spring and leaf fall in autumn and winter because many of our shrubs and trees don't actually lose their leaves. They're evergreen. So I identified someone that I thought would best fit the bill that they could use. Uh, I suppose really what I'm trying to do is help teachers as much as I possibly can so that this transfers into the classroom with a minimum amount of work for them. Because as I say, I taught in high school for 15 years and I know how time challenging teaching can be. Uh, so if I can lessen their load and make the job easier for them, then you know that's one way of hopefully getting them to embrace it. So the next step beyond that, if you like, in Australia, we have a curriculum. Each state and territory taught their own curriculum up until about two years ago. And then the federal education department and the state and territory education departments started to work together to develop a national curriculum called the Australian curriculum. Uh, it's not been entirely braced by every state and territory. It's probably a, a, a fairly accurate way of describing people's response to it. The two major states in Australia, New South Wales and Victoria, uh, have a fairly significant uh, input into what happens in the curriculum. So I think it's fair to say that if the curriculum didn't exactly fit their needs, they were a bit resistant to change. But slowly and surely, we're beginning to embrace an, an Australian curriculum. So one of the questions that we often get when we speak to teachers is, where does it fit with curriculum? So one of the things that I've been doing uh, and, and will continue to do so is going through the protocols and the spheres and actually mapping them against the Australian curriculum. So teachers can see at a glance where a particular protocol fits in with their curriculum. So where they can slot it into their teaching programs. So this is, a, a if you like, a typical uh, example of what I've been doing. And this is a year four. So it's a curriculum mapping exercise. So the, the curriculum statement, where does that fit with a GLOBE protocol or a, a GLOBE activity? Uh, and that's what I've actually done. So teachers can see straight away. They can look at curriculum. They can go, okay, I need to cover off on X, Y, Z. And I can see from this that, you know, if I do the uh, air temperature, the current air temperature, it fits these particular curriculum requirements. So for the science curriculum, we've got science understanding, science as a human endeavor, and science investigation skills. So that's where that fits. And you can see some sort of fit across a, a, a number of, and that's what particularly primary school teachers like, because they have to teach very cross curricula, unlike high school teachers who might just be teaching science or maths, single or just a couple of subjects. So that's what I'm doing with curriculum, and that's a, it's almost essential now for anything that we do that where we're targeting teachers. Uh, what have we got set up for the rest of this year and next year? So I've sort of mapped out the things that I'm planning on doing. Obviously, we've got the, uh, the Asia-Pacific coordinators meeting in Taiwan. Hopefully, that will go ahead. The idea is to do, as you can see along this line, we've got online info sessions for teachers. So the idea is to do at least two a term, and our terms are typically 10 weeks. So one every sort of four or five weeks. Uh, we've got a couple of conferences that unfortunately have been postponed, but the rumor is that they're likely to be like the Globe Conference, be an online conference. So I'm pushing to get a session within those com conferences if they do actually go online. The other thing that we're doing as well is you can see here we've got uh, a lot of these are international days, United Nations days, and you can see they are the 7th of September. We've got International Day for Clean, Clean Air for Blue Skies. So all these days, I plan to do something with our sort of publicity communications team uh, to, to push globe, if you like. It's a bit of a catalyst to get uh, teachers and, and citizen scientists out there engaging with the program. And these are the newsletters that I spoke about before. So we get Globe advertising the newsletters. The other thing I'm thinking about as well is approaching libraries. So we've got lots and lots of libraries in Australia. Uh, and a lot of libraries are keen to do community engagement type activities. And I just think that Globe uh, Observer and the Globe app, the Globe uh, project uh, program, it's a great way of libraries being able to sort of engage with their community. So that's definitely on the to-do list. 
So you can see up there, recruit more schools because the schools have not been particularly active in Australia with the GLOBE program. Uh, so that's obviously going to be a priority moving forward. C complete the curriculum map you saw earlier, that's well on the way. I've done three year levels, so the idea is to do from year four to year 10. This data collection kits, the space agency uh, who are funding the program, uh, I've kindly offered to pay for some uh, data logging equipment, data collection kits. So at the moment, I'm working out, you know, what the data collection kit might look like, uh, and now we can market that to schools. More teacher PD, professional learning, uh, is, is in the pipeline. It would be great if we could go out to schools and, and organize workshops and sessions and things, but like everyone else, we're restricted to online at the moment. Uh, and again, these conferences, if these conferences go ahead, then the idea is, is to book a session in there and do some uh, spruiking of, of the GLOBE program. So when I work with teachers, finally what I do is I show them this. And I suppose as an ex classroom teacher myself, these will be the questions or these will be the reasons why I would use GLOBE in my classroom. Uh, I think it's just a great way of getting students to uh, to appreciate the environment around them you know if they're getting out there one of the states in, in in australia victoria they've gone into lockdown again so everyone's home schooling and that's that's likely to happen for another three or four weeks at least but the rest of the country have got fairly restrictive movement but at least now you can sort of get your students out of the classroom whereas you couldn't do that before it's a great way of contributing to our understanding of the earth you know, whether it's collecting clouds data or whether it's pH, uh, you know, turbidity in water, there's a million and one things that add useful information. And I think uh, it's just it's the, the, the diversity of the program uh, means that you can actually push your higher achieving students, but still cater for students that aren't necessarily as academic. So it's just the versatility of the program. And I think the other thing as well is the fact that it's hands on. You know, a lot of students that I've taught in the past, uh, yeah, to sit in a classroom all day, every day is a bit of an ask for some of those students. So the opportunity to get them outside and do some experiential learning is just a, it's a, it's a real bonus. Uh, and the data collection, it's actually being used. You know, when you hear that NASA people are, are using the data that students are uploading and citizen scientists are uploading, uh, it's a real incentive for them to get involved. You know, the number of times you hear as a student, uh, as a teacher, you know, when will this ever get used? No one's ever going to use this. When am I ever going to need this? And this is a real opportunity to show them that what they're doing does count uh, and it does have value and someone will access that information and use that. And then that's basically it. That's what we I do when I work with students. That's what I'm doing right now with the GLOBE program. So mapping against curriculum, advertising the program as much as I can uh, and getting in touch with teachers and students when I can. And that's it, Desh. Okay, Bill. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very fast we have